Okay, well, let's punch it. And let's go. Uh, we'll get quite a ways toward the finish of the Enlightenment uh, today. Hope, hopefully, we'll maybe almost get it completely finished. Uh, Trey, will you tell me what you see on your screen? Uh, it says inequality versus liberty. Yes, thank you, sir. Um, there is a video on this that I've published that you'll see. Probably most of you, I think, have already uh, have already summarized the videos that are up there. But this this same scenario that we find ourselves in today were the same problems that gave us the French Revolution. This is where history matters. We can learn from the past or we can just repeat the past. I don't know about you, but I would never want to repeat the French Revolution. In the French Revolution, the core problem became tribalism or identity politics. Uh, the French society was divided into three categories. The first estate, the second estate, and the third estate. The first estate um, was the clergy. The second estate was the aristocracy. And the third estate was the rest of us, or the rest of the people, I should say, the common, ordinary people, some of them wealthy, some of them not wealthy, but they, they didn't have royal blood and they were not clergy. There was an uprising from the third estate. And it was all in the name of equality. The idea that we should not have three estates, which I completely agree with. Um, if you've watched any of the stuff about the British royals lately, uh, is it Megan? can't remember her last name, Prince Harry's wife, uh, uh, her interview with Oprah and her claims of racism against the queen and the queen's family. You kind of start getting an idea about the divisions that were present just before the French Revolution. In the name of equality, they eliminated, the third estate eliminated the top two estates. Uh, much of it by beheading the people. Uh, much of it by the first and second estates leaving France, which took the money, which took the French economy down even further, they were already hurting because they had paid so much to help the American Revolution that this was a country that was totally distraught uh, and in debt and collapsing financially. To me, there's just a lot of similarities between that and where America is today. Uh, so I, I just want to encourage you that this study of humanities and any study of history should be able to help us to apply 
things we should and shouldn't do in today's time. The three estates of France represent tribalism. And it's, it's important we see tribalism taking root in American society today in a very big way. It's called identity politics. Uh, again, I'm not a Democrat or a Republican. I am a libertarian, which believes that we should only have the least amount of government that we can possibly have to protect us and provide for us and to secure our personal liberties and freedom. That big, big, big governments, which in my estimation, both Republicans and Democrats have, uh, that's, that's not in the best interest. That's just my thought. I don't care what you believe. You can get an A in this class, even if you're a Nazi. I don't think we'd have any Nazis in this class, but um, fascism is certainly becoming much more fashionable today. Fascism is where people feel like they need an elite dictator to get them out of the mess that the government has gotten them into. That's what happened in the French Revolution. You've got the government expanding and expanding and expanding. They don't have the money to pay for it, but they continue to expand. And as the debt begins to pile up, they start dividing off into their particular tribes or groups, sections, and these sections become violent toward each other and end up in wars. And the Enlightenment would have totally collapsed had it not been for Napoleon, the Enlightenment would have totally collapsed in France at the French Revolution. Napoleon was able to pick up the pieces, even though he was certainly a fascist. But the, the, at that point, the Enlightenment began to, to spread out to other countries, England, Germany, uh, America, and the Industrial Revolution kicked in and gave the Enlightenment a restart. So that's where we are in all of this. Uh, I, I think I'm bringing you uh, up to date here. So um, let's go on here to the next slide. Ultimately, the Enlightenment fell victim to the competing ideas of several sources. Now, let's think again about what the Enlightenment is. It's the period of time that grew out of the scientific revolution. It's the period of time where humans began really utilizing critical thinking and in doing so started reimagining what society could be like. I, I think we see some of that today. Just an example would be like in reimagining a world where there are no police or a different way of policing. 
uh, reimagining the way of income distribution where everybody in the city gets a minimum salary, whether they're working or not. We're already seeing that happen. Oakland, California, for example, Chicago is looking at it to where everybody gets a, a salary, a minimum salary. It's, it's this reimagining of the way society functions. That's what happened in the Enlightenment. The science gave them the ability for critical thinking. And in that critical thinking, they began to divide up into their different, sociologists call them tribes. What is a tribe? It has nothing to do with Native Americans or Africa. A tribe is whatever identity uh, group you associate yourself with. Instead of associating yourself as an American, you may associate yourself as, you know, one of the many, many groups we have today, an evangelical. I'm an evangelical, but that's not my politics. My loyalty is not to evangelicalism. And I, I think it's been a big mistake when evangelicals have become a political party. I wish that would have never happened. I think church needs to stay out of politics. But there are many identity groups. Sometimes they fall along racial lines. Sometimes they fall along economic lines. Sometimes they fall along gender lines. And whenever we get to thinking that everybody should think exactly the way I think, then the problems resurface that created the French Revolution. Okay. There we go. So I, I want us to go into the next chunk of time. The, from the Enlightenment, two branches took off. Up to this point, we've been talking about singular chunks. Renaissance, Reformation, scientific revolution, enlightenment. But after the near death experience of the enlightenment, twins were born and they were not identical twins. They were exactly opposite. There were the romantics and there were those involved in the industrial revolution. So from the enlightenment chunk, twins are born, not identical, oppositional twins. The romantics in the industrial revolution. Now, <clears throat> you can see in, in both of those elements of the two biggest adversaries of the Enlightenment. Uh, um, Rousseau and Voltaire. Voltaire's tribe really gave birth to the Industrial Revolution. Rousseau's tribe really gave birth to the period that we call romanticism or the romantic period. This period 
really was more appealing to people who were less educated. And, and it, it pulled them away from the empirical scientific ideas of the earlier Enlightenment philosophers. So that's the Romantics. They are the offspring of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who said, we got to get back to the good old days, back to the simple life. And and then the industrial revolution goes back to Voltaire, who says, we really need to progress and turn the science that we have created into something that is exceptionally positive, and useful for the improvement of humanity. You're going to see in both of these two areas, so we're getting into two new chunks now, you're going to see uh, the offspring of the uh, uh, enlightenment spur, uh, uh, encouraged by Voltaire and the other offspring encouraged by Rousseau. If you remember in an earlier lecture, what we talked about was Immanuel Kant saying exactly what I'm saying now, that the enlightenment can be very, very good, or it can be very, very bad. So we're seeing that offspring occur here and primarily occur because of the French Revolution. Before the French Revolution totally annihilated the Enlightenment, it was saved by Napoleon. And we need to understand what ultimately killed or almost killed the Enlightenment was the French Revolution. And that revolution began with the best of intentions. They were modeling themselves in many ways after the American Revolution that had separated themselves from King George in England and put themselves under President George Washington in America. So the French Revolution began with really good intentions. And this revolution attempted to implement the orderly representative assemblies of the different groups of people. There's your tribalism. And it rapidly degraded into chaos and into violence. Many people cited the enlightenment induced breakdown of norms as the root cause of the instability and saw that violence as proof that the masses could not be trusted to govern themselves. Step back from this just a minute. The enlightenment resulted in tribalism. Its complete failure of tribalism resulted in many people saying, we just need one leader to tell us all what to do. They got their leader. 
and his name was Napoleon. But the discoveries and the theories of the Enlightenment philosophers continued to influence Western societies, even today. So the Enlightenment pr produced both good and bad. The way I like to say it is when you eat fish, spit out the bones. Uh, just because fish have bones when you're eating them doesn't mean you should quit eating fish just means you should spit out the bones. The Enlightenment was a fish with lots of bones. So there were good things in the Enlightenment which have ultimately really helped us to develop ourselves. However, as I've mentioned, I see us falling back into the chaos that produced the French Revolution. I have never seen America so divided. I believe a lot of that is due to the media on all sides. It seems like the media, journalism in particular, is making an attempt to really divide us up into tribes and then cause us to fight each other. And the result of that, if it's the same result as the French Revolution, would be fascism, us getting one elite ruler who would protect us, provide security for us, and move us on from there. You can see that played out again in Germany in the 1930s and in the 1940s the chaos erupted into identity politics. The best example of that would be the Aryans and the Jews. And it was the Aryans, what Hitler was trying to really promote, which wanted to get rid of the Jews. And so in order to do that, the German people had to elect an elite politician who would be a totalitarian, a one-person rule, to help get them through, to help navigate them through all of the problems presented by tribalism. But if, if we look for a minute at, at the good points of the Enlightenment, and there were many good points, and if we can be guided by a lot of that, that whole period of time, the pain, the suffering, the loss of life, the impoverishment, it will give it some meaning by helping us today. An example, if I move up to the 1930s, would be the whole issue of the concentration camps in Germany and the desire to eliminate, to terminate, Judaism it was a very, very, very painful time. And 
as the sign says, when you leave one of the concentration camps today, never again. I assume, though, us being the kinds of humans that we are, that it could happen again. I want to say it again. I've never seen in my lifetime us being so close to racial wars. Again, you see tribalism at its worst. And was there any good that came out of the Holocaust? You would say, no, it was the most horrific period in world history. That's true. But if there is something good that can have come out of that, it would be that it shows us like an x-ray, the worst in us, how bad we as humans can become when left unchecked. So the enlightenment can show us that. I want to move now to art in the enlightenment. We've uh, shown you some of the orrery. Uh, Joseph Wright of Darby, Derby. Uh, he, it's interesting, I was watching a, I don't know, something on the news the other day, and somebody they were um, interviewing over like a Zoom connection or Skype connection, had this very painting on, on the wall behind him. Uh, what you see here is a mechanical model of the solar system. We saw this quite a bit earlier last week. And it was used to demonstrate the motions of the planets around the sun, making the universe seem almost like a clock like the hands of a clock that go around the face of the clock, the planets of the sun go around the sun. And we saw that and it's, it's compelling to us. Look at the center of this orrery. Uh, it's lit by a gas light. Now, it's interesting that we use that term today, gas lighting, as a term that we generally use for politicians who really won't answer the question, but they move all around the question thinking they're shedding a little light on it, but really not. If you watch much news, You'll see this from politicians on both sides. Gaslighting. So, but this gaslight in this painting is not like that. It's, it represents the sun, S-U-N. And the figure who stands in the foreground with his back to us from our view, the arcs here represent the orbits and the planets. And Wright concentrates on the faces of the figures to create this very compelling narrative. One of the things about great art is your ability to be able to sit there and lose yourself in a painting like that and come up with your 
own story may be very personal to your life and it or it may be about somebody else's life or your family life or something else altogether you can lose yourself in it this is um some some more of the painting in in the 18th century century of enlightenment and it's a much smaller orrery from the 18th century the solar system as a clock emblematic of rationalism i i found that very interesting we've talked some in here about ancient literature of both babylonians and and then much later than that the the macedonians the philosophers but one of the earliest pieces of literature that's best known to mankind is the first chapter of the bible and the second chapter both of them in different literary styles and showing that god created the heavens and the earth and that he just kind of flung out the stars into the universe and that this whole system of stars and planets it becomes our clock our annual clock all of the old calendars calendars were either built on a lunar module or a solar module uh, for example if you look at the calendar in the day of jesus christ the first century different cultures use different calendars at that time but the jewish calendar came out of leviticus 23 and it was totally uh some people call it a luna solar uh kind of around both the sun and the moon but all of the festivals of judaism their whole calendar the rhythm of their year was produced for the entire purpose of the people and the development of the people religiously well there are many other not just scientific uh paintings like that of of uh, Joseph Wright of Derby, but uh, here's one of the paintings of Jacques-Louis David in the tennis court oath. The king had called for a council where all of the estates would come together to work out the problems. The King of France was very much aware of the fact that this thing was moving, this Enlightenment period of time was moving toward uh, violence. And he wanted to bring the people together to talk. Now, as it turned out, the king made a very terrible decision, or perhaps it was made for him, that only the first two estates, the clergy and the aristocracy, the royal royalty, met. And the third estate, everybody else was locked out. So all of these citizens of the third estate went down to a hall it was actually a tennis court 
and they took an oath to the revolution. It's interesting because uh, you can you can see them raising their right hand and swearing allegiance uh, to revolution in France. Jacques Louis David, I want you to remember that name. It will be on the final. Jacques Louis David was the premier French artist during this period of time. He was from France and he developed a style, and you need to remember this, called um, neoclassicism. Some people call it neoclassicalism, both basically the same thing. And here he looks back to the golden age of civilization's past. And he has a father deploying his sons into war and having them take an oath. You can see the women off to the side. By the way, these little magnifying glasses that I've got here for you on the side of this PowerPoint, if you click on those, it'll tell you much more detail about these that these boys would not come back unless the revolution was successful or they would die. And here you see one of the boys being brought back dead. What is David saying? He's saying right here, there are things in life that are worth sacrificing your life for. After the revolution had expired, imploded, Jacques Louis provides us with this painting from uh, Napoleon. Uh, and it's, it's a beautiful painting, but I wanna move on to, to this. And these are just some things for you to think about. Did the political thinkers think people could govern themselves? Now, remember, that's what American politics is based on. We are a government of the people, for the people, and by the people. And right now, we are entering into another test to see if that can work. Lincoln took us through a major test back in 18, in the early 1860s. Now we're going to another test. And whether this test ends up in another war, I, I hope not. I don't think so. I hope we're smarter than that. I'm not totally sure. Can people really govern themselves? Or is the stain of original sin, by that I, I mean the fact that all humans uh, are basically imperfect, does, does that mean that, that our dark inclinations will override the enlightenment within each one of us. Is freedom and liberty, does that mean not to do whatever you want, but the opportunity to do the right thing? For some people, freedom means I can do whatever I want. Nobody can tell me what to do. I'm a free man. This includes things like obedience to authority. 
an authority that's agreed upon by citizens and not a forced authority forced onto us by elite political figures. Is humankind basically good or basically bad? Children, are they naturally good and innocent? Can we make citizens good by training or a modern day word for that would be reimagining. And what about training and education? We're facing all of those things right now, folks, whether or not our elementary school children will be taught along the lines of current thinking about critical race theory or the gay BCs. I'm not against us looking at both of those, but is that going to be the very heart and core, the nexus for our generation, the training that our children get? Are we able to develop ideas based on experience experience of things like the French Enlightenment and World War II and many other things? Or are we going to have to develop ideas based on what the ideas of some elite Harvard professors are? And it all gets back to this question of Humans, are they really by nature good? And it is society's institution that corrupts them. Or are we by nature bad, so we build evil corporations and governments? So, these are things for us to think about in this particular lecture, and I would encourage you to really think about these. You'll be hearing about some of this again in on your final exam, which we're not far away from. Now, I, I know I've lectured a little bit longer, but I'd like to open it now for uh, discussion. Or have I put you all to sleep? What is your opinion on the nature of humans? Do you think we are naturally bad and do good, or do you think we're good and then naturally do and then just what, do? What a great question, Tati. Um, I I think you know Socrates who said in any kind of question or argument, you first got to define. So you got to kind of define what good and bad is. For me, I define good as the perfect. That's the way Plato would have decided. He, in his allegory of the cave, it was the sun. And so I think by nature, none of us is perfect. And therefore, none of us is good. And we have to have help in overriding that. I, I don't know where this particular proverb originated. I was told it was Native American. It, it may be. And it was in each one of us, there are two spirits a good one and a bad one. And it depend and they're constantly fighting each other. And it depends on which one you feed that wins that battle. 
Okay, that's not a very clear answer to your question, but I believe we are divided, that we are a fractured being with capacity for great good or horrific evil. And it just depends on which one we feed. So I guess I've kind of gaslighted you a little bit on that to use the modern phrase. But for me, it, it's not a binary, uh, it, it, it's not a either or thing. It's a both and, we're both good and bad. And we have great capacity for bo both. Great question. Other thoughts? Well, I want to thank you for paying attention and for being present. I, I want to ask you and encourage you to stay open-minded. Don't just accept any idea because somebody else believes in that idea. Don't just believe in God because your parents believe in God. Search it out for yourself. That's what I did. Don't just think politically that all Republicans are bad and all Democrats are good or vice versa because somebody else thinks that. You've got the most incredible creation right there between your ears, your brain. And I encourage you to really use that and do some of the second order thinking. Don't let anybody pressure you. And that includes me. Don't let me pressure you into believing any one way. I, I, I've said in this class before, I don't respect a Christian just because they've accepted what mommy and daddy told them and they really haven't looked into it. I would respect an atheist more who had really considered his or her atheism and thought through it. For me, I've thought through my Christianity with many personal battles, but that's for me. Whatever state of mind you arrive at Arrive at it having ridden on your own train, your train of thought.